Welcome uh, to Chapter 9, Contracts and Advances. This is a very, very important chapter with just a lot of information in it. All of it, virtually every paragraph in this chapter is important for you to know. Uh, I, however, am going to try to highlight the things that you, know, you need to know, uh, certainly to pass this course, uh, but also items that you need to know in your general practice so you know what you're doing, as well as I'll point out uh, some items in here and some material in here, uh, some displays in here that uh, you'll want to kind of refer back to again and again. Uh, the one thing about this 30-hour course is it's a good practitioner course, so the material you have is very good material, and hopefully what we're going through here is you're learning a lot of good stuff, uh, but uh, you certainly will be able to refer back to a lot of the information in, in this textbook and particularly in this chapter here. So we have a lot of information to cover and so uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get through, the, through this thing and we'll get through it as quickly as we can but we'll try to do it as thoroughly as we can and we'll try to make it as interesting as we can. Uh, the page 155 in your book begins with the discussion of the Quinlan Tyson versus Chicago Bar Association. Long story short, Quinlan Tyson was a real estate firm up in the Arlington Heights area. Chicago Bar Association decided they would sue Quinlan Tyson for the illegal practice of law. What they were really doing was making a test case because all brokers in the Chicago area were doing what Quinlan Tyson was, does, what was doing. So Quinlan Tyson was a fine real estate firm, did nothing wrong, but they just turned out to be the test, uh, test case for the Chicago Bar. The long story short, <clears throat> this went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court finally ruled in what's called the Quinlan and Tyson case. <clears throat> and the <clears throat> Supreme Court basically said, okay, brokers and lawyers, you guys got to start working together for the betterment of these real estate transactions. So we're going to tell brokers what they can do, real estate brokers what they can do, and lawyers, we're going to tell you what you can do. So brokers, here's what you can do in, in real estate deals. You can't write your own contracts. You can only use pre-printed contracts. You can fill in the blanks. You can strike things out, and you can add little mini contracts, which are called writers. You cannot practice law. Up until this point in time, brokers were drafting their own deeds. They were giving their opinion of title and other documents, uh, uh, any document that was really necessary to complete the transaction. So that stopped. So then the court turned to the lawyers and said, okay, lawyers, you guys get to prepare the legal documents in a real estate transaction, uh, including deeds. You can give opinions of title. You can draft clauses and any other legal document that's required in a real estate transaction. However, lawyers, you can't say anything about an opinion of value. So, Mr. Lawyer, when you're dealing with your clients, you can't say, you're going to pay what for that property? What are you crazy? I'm not going to let you get involved in this. That property is not worth it. So, lawyers, you stay out of the, you know, sort of the marketing end of the real estate business, and brokers, you stay out of the sort of the, the legal end of the real estate business. And since that time, they've been just happy together working hand-in-hand hand along the road to, real, to happy and successful real estate transactions. Uh, page 155, 156, begin our discussion when we talk about real estate, uh, various real estate contracts. One of the first contracts we're going to talk about are the listing agreements. Listing agreements are personal service contracts between sponsoring brokers and sellers. There are basically three kinds of listing agreements in Illinois. There is an exclusive right to sell, there is the exclusive agency, and there is the open listing. What's the difference? Exclusive right to sell listings are where, is where the seller gives one agent the sole authority to find a buyer for the property for a specific period of time. And if the agent does that, or agency does that, then the agency gets paid. Uh, the exclusive agency uh, agreement, listing agreement, again, allows only one agent to market the property uh, over a, whatever period of time the, the listing agreement's for. However, the owner reserves the right to sell the property himself and not pay anybody a commission. And maybe an example of an exclusive agency might be uh, maybe a developer. A developer hires an agent to market all of his uh, track homes. Uh, the agent puts all of these in the multiple listing service. And if uh, someone comes as a result of the agent's uh, marketing efforts, the multiple listing service or other efforts the agent does, they show up at the subdivision, they buy a property, agent gets a commission. However, the developer, owner, if you will, 
uh, would also re maintain their own sales staff. And if a buyer showed up not through the efforts of a real estate agent, but because they saw the, the pretty yellow, uh, they saw yellow ribbons and signs and flags outside of the subdivision, uh, uh, the uh, office of the subdivision, sales office, and that the prospect walked in there and bought through one of the owner's uh, employees, sales employees, then the owner would not owe a commission. The difference between the exclusive right to sell, exclusive agency then, is the exclusive agency does allow the owner to sell himself and not have to pay a commission. <coughs> open listings, <coughs> we don't see these very, very often, <coughs> but an open listing is a listing where technically the seller says, hey, Mr. Agent, uh, Mr. Brokerage Company, if you find me uh, someone to buy my, uh, you know, my uh, 100 acres in central Illinois, I'll pay you a commission for that. And then he goes around to every agent and every brokerage agent in town and says the same thing. He also maintains the ability to sell the property himself. So open open listing is anyone who produces the buyer gets the, gets the commission. Continuing on with listing agreements, the multiple listing uh, is the multiple listing is not a different kind of listing agreement. The multiple listing is all is an exclusive right to sell, as we talked about in the earlier slide, or the exclusive agency. Either of those two are put in a multiple listing service. So we call that a multiple listing, but in fact, it's either an exclusive right to sell or an exclusive agency listing. Uh, the big deal with multiple listing uh, services is that if you're going to put an uh, listing contract in there, it can't be an open listing. And all we do with multiple listings is it's really just a big information sharing service to help market properties for, uh, for sellers. So it's, it's a great marketing tool. However, as good as it might be before you place your listing in a multiple listing service, remember you must give sellers written permission to do any kind of advertising, including put an MLS, even as good of a service as you think it is, they must give permission. And sometimes sellers don't want their properties in the multiple listing service. Uh, we should also know their, uh, the expiration of listing period is important. We're going to bring this up about two or three times. Every listing in Illinois has to have a definite time that it terminates. Uh, if it doesn't, the listing is invalid. So your listing agreements must have in each of them a definite time of broker employment and when that will end. So nobody needs to give notice to terminate a listing period. We'll know by the uh, definite time period stated in the listing. Broker protection clauses, uh, uh, you can uh, in listing agreements to put a broker protection clause uh, for residential or for commercial uh, properties. Uh, the broker protection clause simply says that for a period of time after the listing is terminated, if the seller sells himself to someone that the broker brought to that property, then the seller has to pay a commission. Uh, the, uh, the caveat here is, however, if seller relists under another listing agreement with another broker, and then someone comes that the original broker had the property and buys, then the seller is not obligated to pay two commissions. Uh, however, this is not true with commercial listings. Uh, commercial listings, uh, even if uh, a, it was relisted with another commercial company and was sold to a to prospective buyers that the first broker brought before, while the contract was uh, still valid, enforceable, uh, then the uh, uh, seller would owe two commissions. So the broker protection clause uh, will terminate with residential property when the property is relisted with another broker, uh, not true with commercial property. Remember, these are personal services contracts between sponsoring brokers and sellers. Very important expiration of listing period. Illinois does not have a uniform or state approved listing contract. So brokerage companies are free and sellers are free with their brokerage companies to uh, develop their own listing contracts if they want to. Typically sellers aren't going to do it, but uh, there isn't any uniform uh, listing contract. Uh, uh, typically residential uh, firms will use listing contracts uh, that are germane or usually uh, uniform or used in their, uh, their own uh, board, real estate board area. Uh, so uh, each board may have its own listing contract and or sales contract. 
with the commercial firms, uh, usually they just develop their own listing contract. They're, with the commercial firms, there's, they're, they're probably all each individual drafted individually. So if you as a real estate firm want to develop your own listing contract, that's okay. I would certainly advise you to read this chapter very carefully before you do and certainly seek legal advice before you draft one. Many MLSs have input sheets, which you can see on page figure 5.5 in the earlier chapter, chapter 5, figure 5.5. And you may want to take a look at that, uh, whether it's a commercial property or residential property. Uh, generally, when these properties are put into these, these uh, multiple list services, whether it's the local uh, residential board or the Northern Illinois MLS, the Rockford MLS, or wherever, or whether it's CoStar or uh, LoopNet, if it's a commercial kind of property, uh, typically there's some kind of input sheet that must be filled out and submitted so there's some uniformity of the listings that are put in there. So be familiar with your input sheets before you put properties in MLSs if you're going to do that or any multi-list multi service. Listing agreement disclosures. Uh, in our listing agreements then, we want to make sure that uh, uh, these things are found in the in the uh, uh, listing agreement where we tell our sellers that they are obligated and we are obligated to disclose material facts, which we've talked about in Chapter 1 and Chapter 5, that we are obligated to uh, disclose any special interest. Chapter 5, that means if we want to purchase property on our own account as a licensee or we're selling our own property as licensees, we have to disclose that to prospective purchasers or sellers. Special compensation, if there's some special compensation that we're getting, if you will, a referral fee from a, 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 a fee from a, a buyer brokerage fee as well as a, a, as well as a listing commission, uh, we must disclose any special compensation we receive uh, to uh, all the parties in the transaction. Any, you know, uh, uh, $100 uh, bonus fee or some other, other compensation other than the listing agreement, uh, other than the listing commission that we've been agreeing to, we must disclose that. And that also must appear on the uh, RESPA statement at closing. The earnest money and purchaser default, if for some reason uh, the seller isn't going to get earnest money, if a purchaser should, purchaser should default, we want to make sure they're aware of that. Uh, so any disp disposition of earnest money that might not accrue to the seller, we need to know the seller just in case the purchaser does default and we can't go back to the listing contract and say, sorry, you're not going to get the earnest money even though they defaulted. Uh, chapter 5 talks about that as well. Property conditions, chapters 5 and chapter 6 talk about disclosure of any uh, you know, material property condition, anything that's affecting the uh, habitability of the property. Um, certainly the environmental, uh, whether it's lead-based paint or radon disclosure, um, we have to tell our sellers with residential property that they're going to have to fill out that residential property disclosure form. Um, there were some forms for commercial properties similar to that. Uh, we need to see if in your area there are uh, disclosure forms for commercial properties that uh, the seller may have to also uh, uh, complete. Uh, before the property is listed and, and, and put on and where there's any uh, potential buyers that might be interested in the property. Uh, so structural defects, mechanical defects, other conditions that they should know of, about in order to make an informed decision are what we would call property conditions that must be disclosed. Obviously, once a listing agreement is signed, by the seller and the sponsoring broker. Uh, Illinois law prohibits any addition or deletion or alteration with listing without the written consent of the seller. If uh, there is an alteration uh, and the seller has not agreed to it, uh, the listing will be void. Uh, listing agreement issues on page 158. Again, if you were going to draft your own listing agreement or if you have one that's used in your area, these are the, the kinds of things that must be in your listing agreement. Certainly the list price of the property, uh, how the commission is going to get paid, what, you know, what's the commission going to be, when it's going to be paid, is it paid at closing or is it due when a buyer is procured or is it due sometime after closing. 
um, the time duration of the of the listing agreement, the names of the sponsoring broker and the seller, uh, and uh, if you drop way to the bottom, a statement of the designated agent, which means that, that we're going to have a designated agent and also put the designated agent in there, whoever that agent might be. Uh, address or legal description of the property. Uh, with legal descriptions, just one quick thing. Uh, you should never write a copy a legal description onto any kind of document, whether it be a sales contract or whether it be a, uh, a listing contract. If you must use a legal description, then get the seller's old title policy, make a copy of the legal description, and then just put that as an addendum to the contract. But don't write a legal description because if you make a mistake with it, it will invalidate the contract. Minimum services, a statement that uh, we as brokers offer, offer, must offer minimum services to our sellers, statement of non-discrimination, statement regarding antitrust, and of course a designated agency statement. Uh, again, no uniform or state approved listing contract in Illinois. Some states have one listing contract everybody has to use. We don't. That's important, time duration. Statement of non-discrimination is important. A seller needs to know their obligations with non-discrimination, and they must know what our obligations are with non-discrimination. And then, of course, the designated agency, who the designated agent is going to be, who's going to represent the seller. Uh, broker's authority and responsibilities. Continuing on, what are the other things that should be in our listing contracts? Uh, what other issues, if you will? Uh, the broker's authority and responsibility, uh, one is to place a sign on the property uh, if they want it, uh, to advertise the property through traditional methods or using by, so, by using social media if the seller wants that, uh, authorizing buyers and brokers through a multiple listing service and internet if the sellers want that, uh, allow the licensee to show the property at reasonable times and a reasonable, reasonable notice to the seller in, in whatever terms or conditions or times or uh, procedure that is convenient for the seller, not for the broker. Uh, accept uh, earnest money deposits on behalf of the seller and what the broker's responsibilities are in holding funds. So we want to tell the uh, as a listing agent where we will be holding earnest monies and if the seller prefers that we don't and they want someone else to hold the earnest money like their attorney or uh, maybe a title company perhaps, or, uh, then uh, you'll want to negotiate that and make sure there are, everyone's in agreement to who's going to hold all earnest money. Broker's authority and responsibilities continued. Uh, we want to make sure our contracts, again, we have the names of the party, the name of the brokerage firm, listing price, uh, a real detailed statement of any real and personal property that will be included in the sale. That's why form contracts that are already have been developed by local boards and local bar associations are usually very, very good contracts because they cover uh, all of this stuff in, in a lot of detail and every kind of uh, personal property item you can think of is going to be on that contract somewhere. Uh, we're going to talk about a uh, sales contract in a second as it relates to those things. But this should also be on the listing contract because this eventually is going to come up on the sales contract. You should find out from the seller if there's any leased equipment. We don't want to be selling, a, uh, pretend to be selling a uh, security system to a prospective, prospective buyer only to find out that the seller was leasing it and didn't have the authority to sell it. A description of the premises, proposed dates for closing and buyer's possession. So closing dates is important and also when is buyer's possession? Is it day of closing? Is it before closing? Not a good idea. Is it after closing? Have your broker or if your real estate board has a training class, go over your listing contract line by line. So if you haven't done that before, uh, you know, it's, it's something you really are sort of obligated to do. Uh, have your broker go through it or many uh, of the real estate boards uh, have training classes where they talk about listing contracts and sales contracts and do a pretty good job of going, going through these things line by line. Closing issues, what kinds of issues do we need to be concerned about when we close, uh, evidence of ownership, which is typically going to be a deed, uh, maybe a bill of sale for personal property items, uh, any encumbrances on the property that 
uh, might affect uh, marketability of title. Uh, perhaps there's a home warranty program that the seller's uh, offering uh, where uh, through uh, a company like American Home Shield, the seller will buy a home warranty program that will uh, protect the him as well as the new purchaser on any defects in working equipment for a period of time. And these are actually very good ideas. So uh, if there's a home warranty program, uh, what does it cover, uh, and uh, who pays for it? Uh, sometimes sellers pay for it, sometimes sellers will pay for it up until closing, and then buyers have to pay for it. Sometimes seller pay for it for a year after closing, then buyer pays for it. Sometimes the agent pays for it. So not only uh, if there's a home warranty program, you want to find out who's going to be paying for this thing. Um, commission. Remember in Illinois, commissions are always negotiable. And uh, antitrust words, we always want to have uh, words uh, that, that tell our sellers that, uh, that commissions are always negotiable. No one sets commission rates in Illinois. And, of course, other closing issues, termination, what happens when the, when the contract terminates. We're going to talk about uh, termination in uh, just a second. Continuing on with uh, closing issues, of course, bro broker protection clauses, we talked about that before. So... Uh, that's something that uh, the sellers and brokers need to be uh, clear on. Uh, the big thing with broker protection clauses is that they need to be for a, sp a specific period of time, whether it's 30, 60, 90 days, one year, whatever it might be. Make sure there's a time period with those broker protection clauses. Uh, warranties by owner, this isn't the same as the home warranties we talked about before. These warranties are uh, any of the assurances or disclosures that the seller said that they would uh, give in marketing and in, in selling their property. Uh, you know, is it suitable for its intended purpose? Does it comply with zoning and building codes? Uh, the uh, uh, seller needs to tell us if it doesn't. Uh, is it going to be transferred to the buyer in the same condition it was uh, when, it w when they looked at the property? Is it going to be sold as is? Um, any repairs or alterations the seller is supposed to do before closing? Uh, any other known defects? Uh, Indemnification of warning, warning <coughs> it simply means that the uh, seller and the sponsoring broker may agree to hold each other harmless for any in incorrect information that either of them supplies. So uh, basically we're saying that uh, if uh, a client gives information that's, that's n untruthful and the broker relies on it, had no reason to know, not believe the seller, the broker won't be responsible <coughs> if there's a, a suit or something after as far as an undisclosure. <coughs> Uh, of course, we talk about minimum services. We need to make sure that the sellers know what our minimum services are here in Illinois, and they're entitled to these things, <coughs> can demand them from us. <coughs> Excuse me. Signature of the parties. Uh, certainly all the parties have to sign the contract, and this is why it's important to find out who's in title. Uh, whoever is in title on, on the property, as far as uh, the sellers, must sign the contract. And even if only one of the parties is entitled but they're married, it'd probably be a good idea to have both parties sign, a husband and wife, even if only one of the parties actually owns the property. That we get into releasing homestead rights and, and other issues there too. So make sure you have the appropriate parties uh, signing the listing agreements. And, of course, the date the contract is signed is important, so we know that uh, when, if there's any uh, dates that are germane that go around from the date it was listed, uh, for instance, if it was uh, the termination period, is going to be 90 days from the date the contract is signed. We have to make sure we got the date when the contract was signed identified. As we, we talked about uh, listing agreements between sellers and brokers, now we'll talk about buyer rep, rep agreements, buyer brokerage agreements between buyers and agents. Um, an exclusive buyer agency is a contract whereby a buyer agrees that during the buyer brokerage time period he will pay an agent uh, a commission if the agent is successful in finding him property. In fact, during that listing period of time, if any other agent finds have the buyer a property or if the buyer buys property himself on his own behalf, he still pays the commission to the agent. So the exclusive buyer agency, big red flag for buyers, means that during that listing period you're going to pay that agent a commission whether you buy the property directly by yourself or if you have another agent act on your behalf. 
And if you have another agent acting on your behalf under a brokerage agreement, you may end up paying two commissions. So Mr. Buyer, uh, you know, be kind of a caveat emptor there. Uh, exclusive buy agency buyer agency is where a buyer would hire an agent to help him find contract, but he's not exclusive to that one agent. So that if he does buy through another agent, he would only pay a commission to the other agent, whatever agent was sort of successful in marketing the property. The buyer, however, maintains the right to sell the property himself and uh, not pay anybody commission. Now, the open buyer agency simply means whether you as an agent or anybody as an agent or the buyer uh, pr uh, finds the buyer during you know a p uh, whatever period of time, and there's really no period of time with open buyer and agency agreements because there's no writings with this. These are usually oral. So basically, an open buyer agency says, whatever broker out there uh, finds me the uh, finds me the seller, I'll pay him a commission or a fee. Uh, or but I retain the property as the buyer to purchase on my own behalf and not pay anybody. So the open buyer agency is kind of the, similar to the open listing contract. First one to perform is the first one to get paid. Remember with the exclusive agency buyer agency, you might want to think that both the buyer, since we say agent so much here, both the, the buyer is between these, ag these agents, I suppose you could say. So the buyer has the right to market the property himself, an exclusive agency, buyer agency. And you have to know both of these. And the you have to know these three things for your final exam. You're going to be, you have to know what an exclusive buyer agency is. The exclusive agency, buyer agency, you know, where the buyer still can sell the property himself. Um, I suppose, you know, if I thought about it, we could probably come up with a little better terms for these things because they're a little confusing, aren't they? But try to memorize that if you could, okay? Uh, with, the with the exclusive agency, buyer agency, buyer can still sell the property himself, not pay a commission. Uh, buyer protection from possible commission payment uh, would be with your exclusive agency, buyer agency, if in fact he sells, he buys himself. How do uh, broker employment agreement uh, terminate on page 163 and 4, whether they're the, the buyer agency agreements or whether they're listing agreements uh, on page 163 at the bottom? How do we terminate these broker employment agreements? Um, certainly when the contract is fulfilled, fulfilled, let's just say we have a closing, somebody buys, somebody sells, we have a closing, you know, contract terminates. It can terminate by expiration of the time period, uh, destruction of the property, maybe a severe zoning change where you can't use it during, you know, for what the intended purpose was, condemnation or eminent domain where the government come and takes it, that'll terminate these agreements, bankruptcy or foreclosure. Uh, when we talk about bankruptcy or foreclosure, we're talking about uh, uh, the bankruptcy of the uh, client uh, or foreclosure on the client would terminate a listing agreement. Mutual agreement of the parties, death or, of, or incapacity of either party. So if the broker dies or the owners die <coughs> or buyers die, <coughs> the, um, these contracts are terminated. Notice we said it would be the sponsoring broker's death and not the designated agent or salesperson. Their death would not terminate a buyer brokerage or a listing agreement. Only the death of the two parties uh, to the contract, two parties being the seller, <coughs> sellers, or the or the uh, buyers. Okay, I just let me try to thought. Sorry. Or the, so death or uh, or. Inc Death or incapacity of either party, the parties being seller, sponsoring broker, buyer, sponsoring broker. Breach by either party, either of the parties breached their contract, they didn't do what they said they were going to do, that could terminate the contract too. Sales contracts on page 164, uh, there is a lot here. Uh, uh, you're not going to really be tested on a lot of this stuff from page 164 all the way through the contract itself on page 173. It's uh, excuse me on pay up and through page 177, 177. 
Um, uh, but at some point in time, you may want to read it through. So here's what we want to know about sales contracts. First of all, when we're reusing a form that's going to be a sales contract, it cannot say at the top of it, offer to purchase. It has to say sales agreement, sales contract, agreement of sales, something to that effect, but can't say offer to purchase. Years ago, we used to have, quote, sales contracts that we put offer to purchase on, and then the 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 uh, agents would say to buyers, oh, it's, it, you know, it's just an offer. Let's make an offer on their property. It's just an offer to purchase. Well, if that offer is accepted, it's a sales contract. And so uh, we misled many uh, buyers into thinking when they were making an offer that there wasn't a consequence to that offer. But when it's accepted, there certainly is a consequence. We have a binding sales contract, don't we? So we can't use uh, real estate contracts that have that terminology. Ripening the contract. Actually, I've never heard of that before, but who cares? But the big deal is from offer and counteroffer to sales contract, what we're basically saying is when a contract is being negotiated, we have a meeting of the minds, and the meeting of the minds is reached by what we call offer and acceptance. Buyer makes an offer, seller either accepts it or makes a change, creates a new counteroffer back to the buyer. He either accepts it, makes a change, makes a counteroffer back to the seller. Seller either accepts it, makes a change, counteroffer back to the buyer. And so it goes back and forth until at the very end, there is a meeting of the minds where both parties now have signed the um, uh, sales contract. And at that point in time, then, we have a binding sales contract. Up until that point in time, it's just offer and acceptance going back. But as soon as it's signed, it's ripened to a sales contract with all the rights and attendant responsibilities uh, uh, by, uh, between the parties. Page 165 to 179 shows you, uh, you know, a multi-board residential real estate contract that's used primarily in the northern Illinois area <coughs> between a number of the boards. And it's a very good contract. You can read it through. Remember, the contracts that are in this uh, textbook here uh, are all copyrighted. So you can't just uh, Xerox them off and use them, OK? Um, you might be able to purchase them, you know, perhaps. So we discussed uh, offer and acceptance, uh, <clears throat> which your book calls mutual assent. Uh, which is the way we arrive at meeting of the minds between the parties. Uh, with multiple offers, uh, we might be aware that, uh, you know, that a, a seller uh, should not be accepting multiple offers. It's great to get multiple offers, but don't be signing multiple offers. You don't want to have more of the too many sales contracts you've signed out there because you're going to have obligations under each. So while you're uh, looking at multiple offers, only accept one at a time. And, uh, you know, you can have what are called backup offers, but they're, these are, you're not going to be signing these offers, okay? So uh, uh, contingencies, uh, contingencies will be in contracts. These are additional conditions uh, that must be met before the contract is enforceable. Um, you know, a contingency might be a mortgage contingency where uh, the, uh, the buyer now has, uh, you know, 120 days to get mortgage financing at, uh, at 4%. Uh, with, uh, you know, two points or something. Um, so if he can't uh, get ma make that contingency, then the contract uh, uh, terminates uh, and is not enforceable. Uh, but once these contingencies are met, then we continue on with an enforceable contract. Amendments and addendums. Um, so, and also with multiple offers, you want to present all offers just because uh, you know, a, a, your seller has already accepted a, an offer. Uh, if you have other offers, you must at least present them to your seller. And also don't determine what offers you think your sellers will or won't accept. Uh, let the sellers decide which offers they do or won't, don't want to accept. So present all offers, high, low, those that you like, those that you don't like. If you have offers on, uh, from prospective buyers on your seller's property, you must present them. Uh, and uh, the uh, contingencies that we said, you know, those are things that must be met in order to keep the contract, uh, you know, to, to eventually get an executed contract. During the term of contingencies, we have what's called an executory contract, which means that it's a contract that's in the, f in the process of being executed or completed. Until all contingencies have been met, we don't have an executed contract. We have an executory contract. 
and amendments and addendas. We want to know all, in fact, all three of these things are important for you for your final exam. Amendments and addendums. We want to know that we can add amendments or addendums and, and they don't change any of the original terms or conditions. They're just, if you will, additions or amendments, but they don't change any of the original terms of the contract. Termination of contracts, uh, cancellation of contracts, um, the uh, during a contract, we may have professional inspections. As we mentioned before, we have mortgage contingency. We have an attorney review process where the attorneys can review the contracts and uh, they can make some modifications to the contract. Um, but you have to look at the sales contract to allow how much modification the attorneys can make. So just because there is an attorney review uh, clause in a contract doesn't mean that uh, the attorney can simply, uh, you know, sort of willfully just cancel a contract on behalf of his clients. So uh, do, do look at those, uh, those uh, cancellation clauses and the uh, attorney review clauses in the contracts. Other contract provisions, of course, will be fixtures and personal properties. Uh, fixtures, those things staying with the property that are part of the property, personal property. Maybe there's some furniture going to be left behind. Perhaps uh, some other, uh, you know, maybe uh, appliances that we might call personal property. Maybe a washer dryer, for instance. Uh, we want to identify all of the things that will or won't be staying with the property. And again, will or won't be staying with the property. Possession, when is possession going to be? Is it closing, after closing, in some cases before closing? As I say before, not probably a good idea for that. Uh, short sales, what happens in the event there's a short sale? Uh, any of the statutory disclosures that we talked about before? Uh, condominium disclosures, if you're dealing with a condominium, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, association finances uh, that need to be disclosed. You're going to have the uh, uh, the uh, uh, rules and regulations of the condominium that must be uh, disclosed to prospective purchasers before they purchase uh, the uh, rules and regulations of the condominium association um, and so dealing with condominiums you have a few other disclosures that must be given to prospective uh, purchasers uh, both uh, regarding the uh, condominium associations uh, uh, rights and obligations as well as any of the uh, uh, the rules and regulations that the prospective purchaser is going to have to follow. Sometimes these are called a declaration of condominium restrictions. So these documents must be presented to purchasers before they purchase property in a, condo, a condominium uh, or a townhouse situation. Uh, title uh, you know, what can I, how do we, how does seller uh, give title? Does he give an abstract? Does he give a title insurance policy? Um, and uh, uh, how long does the purchaser have to take a look at that? Uh, is there going to be a plat of survey as part of the, the, the title uh, uh, obligations? Um, and um, uh, what happens if, uh, the, in the buyer's opinion, it isn't marketable title? What does the seller and or buyer have to uh, do to, you know, continue closing the sale where there's an objection to marketable title? Uh, contingencies, uh, these are uh, the things that we talked about before. Are these subject to uh, common contingencies? Were these mortgage contingencies? Maybe uh, the, proper, the sale is contingent upon a certain kind of inspection or maybe contingent, contingent upon a zoning change as a prerequisite to closing. Termination of contracts. Uh, how are they terminated? Uh, obviously by partial performance, impossibility of performance, mutual agreement, operation of law and rescission. And, you know, you can read all those through and that's great. You're not going to be asked anything in, in this course on, on those because they're really out of the purview of real estate brokers and agents. Uh, you, you don't make the determination whether a, a contract is being terminated because of these, these issues. Uh, typically the ones that you'll see are mutual agreement with the seller and the buyer mutually agree to terminate the contract and then rescission of the contract where one uh, party cancels and terminates the contract uh, sort of as if it was never made. Um, it, it usually uh, when a um, 
uh, contract is terminated, um, it's uh, not necessarily returning it to the original position, and therefore there may be some remedies that one or the other party has, and including these remedies could be a remedy for um, a, perhaps a breach, uh, maybe there's a remedy for earnest money, maybe there's a remedy for, uh, for comp compensatory damages. So in this whole area of uh, contracts and when they're terminated and why they're terminated and rights and obligations to parties upon termination, this is not something you're ever involved in. This is between the attorneys and the sellers and or buyers. Your concern, however, would be that you need to return all the documents and any monies in the transaction upon termination. And part of that is going to be the earnest deposit and return. And page 187 talks very specifically about earnest money, that when it's to be deposited, when it's to be returned. The big thing about returning earnest money is that you will never want to return it until all parties to the transaction sign it first. Don't be bullied or cajoled or uh, hand, held, hand whipped into uh, returning earnest money to either the seller or the buyer until all parties agree. If you do not follow that advice, you will be sorry. <laughs> And speaking of escrow funds, page 185 through 187 has a, a, a very detailed uh, information on escrow funds. And uh, if you are holding escrow funds, these are, this is certainly an area of this, uh, the bo this book you want to you know, certainly keep at your ready to take a look at it when you can because it does a pretty good job of uh, reviewing a lot of this uh, stuff and what you need to do. Very important escrow funds. Escrow funds are the number one reason why, uh, why brokers in Illinois are disciplined. Misuse, misappropriation, misaccounting for escrow funds. So you definitely want to know how to do that. Uh, in Illinois, when you become a uh, sponsoring broker, a quote managing broker, you sign a consent to examine and audit special accounts form if you're holding escrow uh, funds. So from the very beginning, you're telling the IDFPR that you are going to hold escrow funds, and you're going to tell them the depository there that you're holding it at and who the account signatories are. So you're also going to give them permission to come into your office at any time and examine and audit your, your um, escrow accounts. Escrow accounts are monies, promissory notes, security deposits, which benefit the parties to the real estate transaction. Act, act, real estate transaction. Typically, we're thinking escrow, fund, escrow uh, accounts is earnest money and security deposit. That's the two big ones. Uh, branch office uh, offices have escrow accounts. Uh, remember the time of deposit or disbursement is very important found on page 187 it gives you a very detailed description of when you put money in and when you put mo when, when you disperse um, uh, earnest money and how that's handled um, escrow account rules and records uh, and interest bearing are you know again uh, found uh, following that uh, you'll see exactly the um, ledger and journal and reconciliation statements and how uh, that's to be handled. Uh, Interest-bearing accounts, you only put them in interest-bearing escrow accounts with the permission of the parties. And also when you get their written permission, uh, you would also find out who uh, is entitled to the interest or if it's split or if it only goes to one of the parties. But that's also determined by in writing by the parties with interest-bearing escrow accounts. Number one rule with escrow funds is no commingling. Technically, the broker cannot put any of his brokerage funds in his escrow accounts. We must keep these separate. Um, and uh, the only time you can, quote, commingle is to put a little bit of money in to maintain the account. So if you have to put in $100 every so often to maintain the account, or you have to put a certain sum in there in order to buy checks, and this is your own money, that's okay. But you will actually have a form uh, that you'll, um, where that will appear so that if the department looks at it, they can actually take those small funds that you put in to maintain and keep the account, they're able to actually see what those are as well. So you'll have to account for, the, for your own funds even though they're the small, um, you know, sort of procedural funds to maintain the accounts. So page 186 
uh, has a, a nice little summary of escrow accounts, and you know that might be something that you want to, you know, maybe make a copy of and keep somewhere in your office just to make sure you're familiar with all that. That's it's a figure 9.2 on page 186 is a good overview, a quick overview to a summary of escrow account rules, and that might be something you might look over just one time, just read it through one time. It would be a good idea for the final exam. Escrow records, we must maintain them in a way the department prescribes. So the department describes you can do this manually if you want to or if you want to have some uh, form of uh, electronic uh, escrow record keeping system, uh, that's okay too, uh, but your, your, your escrow accounts must all be kept in uh, a, a, a accounting uh, a practice uh, laid out specifically and exactly the way that the department uh, is laying it out. And the department will provide you with uh, more uh, forms on how to do this. So everybody should be maintaining their escrow accounts in exactly the same way, whether they do them manually or they do them in an electronic version. And primarily what you need to have is a journal. You'll see one on page 189. Think of a journal as like a checkbook. And it's uh, the entries are made by date. Uh, a ledger card, uh, think of that as being a sort of a transaction uh, card that takes each transaction, what money was put in for that transaction, when the money was taken out, be each deal that you're going to do, if you will. The ledger card is, if you will, a deal card, okay, each deal you're working on. Monthly reconciliation uh, is at the, uh, within 10 days at the end of each month, you must reconcile or balance your bank accounts, your escrow ac accounts from your bank. And then uh, you must also uh, keep uh, your master account log, which is on page 193, which is kind of the way you account for uh, all uh, open trans the out outstanding transactions that you have. Uh, and it's sort of a quick, the master account log is kind of a quick way to, for each escrow account that you have, you can see where the account is being held, the address of that account, and a quick description of the count, and it's done by account numbers. So uh, there is that's uh, the master account log is kind of a quick way to look at each of your escrow accounts very quickly to see where they're at. So we want to know what the journal is on page 189. Take a look at that. We want to know this what a ledger card is. We want to know this monthly conciliation, reconciliation, and the rules related to that. And of course, that master account log on page 193, what what that is. Another kind of brokerage agreement we deal with is the property management agreement. And uh, on page 190, 184, excuse me, that's 194, uh, you'll see the property management agreement and all the things that should be involved in the management. And again, at one point in time, just kind of read all those through. I wouldn't memorize anything there. Uh, I don't think there's anything really critical with property management agreements on your final examinations. But you may want to just kind of take a, a look through that and, and see. You'll see much of the same uh, terms on a management agreement as on a listing agreement. Some of, uh, some of the very same clauses on property management agreements as on listing agreements. Remember the general, a property management agreement is, creates a general agency. And you'll remember that a listing agreement creates a specific agency. That was something we talked about in one of the, our first chapters on agency. So you've got a, your contracts and advances quiz. You want to take that. Good luck to you. And we'll see you uh, in Chapter 10.